Hello dear students welcome back to the second semester of lesson number 6 towns traders and crafts person now in this chapter we are going to learn about what are the kinds of towns that had in the medieval period then who were the traders and who were the crafts person so let's begin what would a traveler visiting a medieval town expect to find this would depend on what kind of a town it was a temple town an administrative center a commercial town or a port town to name just some possibilities in fact many towns combined several functions they were administrative centers temple towns as well as centers of commercial activities and crafts production so now administrative center before administrative center let us see on map 1 some important centers of trade and artisanal productions in central and south india central india ahmedabad vrindavan ajmer murshidabad kolkata then somnath in south india it was kamalapuram then shabimalai kanchipuram tiruva tiruvannamalai madurai all these were the artisan productions and center of the trade now administrative centers you read about chola dynasty in chapter 2 let's travel in our imagination to thanjavur the capital of the cholas as it was a thousand years ago the perennial river kaveri flows near this beautiful town one hears the bells of the rajesh rajeshwara temple built by king raja 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 chola the town's people are all praised for its architect kun kunjara malan raja raja praised for it raja raja perunthas perunthas chan who who has proudly curved his name on the temple wall inside is a massive shiva linga so thanjavur the capital of cholas a thousand years ago emerged as an administrative centers as well as a temple town as thanjavur was an administrative center kings held courts in uh, in the mandaps which was parts of palaces issuing orders to their subordinates now the town is bursting with market selling grain spices cloth and jewelry water supply for the town comes from wells and tanks the saliya weavers of thanjavur and the nearby towns of urayur are busy producing cloth for flags to be used in the temple festivals fine clothes for the king and nobility and coarse cotton for the masses some distance away at shivami malai the staptis or sculptures are making equisites bronze idols and tall ornamental bell temple lamps so temple towns represents a very important pattern of not temple towns but the towns in the market they represents a very important uh, pattern of urbanization the process by which cities develop then rulers also they build temples to demonstrate their devotions to various deities now deities means the god or the goddess whom we worship now temple towns and pilgrimage centers thanjavur is also an example of a temple town temple towns represents a very important patterns of urbanization the process by which cities develop temples were often central to the economic and society rulers built temples to demonstrate their devotions to various deities they also endowed temples with grants of land and money to carry out elaborate rituals feed pilgrim pilgrims and priests and celebrate festivals 
Pilgrims who flocked to the temples also made donations. Now, important temple towns, the temple authorities used their wealth to finance trade and business banking. Gradually, a large number of priests, workers, artisans, traders, etc., settled near the temple to cater to their needs and those of the pilgrims. Thus, grew temple towns. Towns emerged around temples such as those of Vilasvamin, Vilasa or Vidisha in Madhya Pradesh and Somnath in Gujarat. Other important temple towns included Kanchipuram and Madurai in Tamil Nadu and Tirupati in Andhra Pradesh. Pilgrimage centers also slowly developed into townships. Vrindavan, Uttar Pradesh and Tiruvann Tiruvannan Malai in Tamil Nadu are examples of two such towns. Ajmer in Rajasthan was the capital of the Chauhan king in the 12th century and later became the Subha headquarters under the Mughals. It provides an excellent example of religious coexistence. Khawaja Munudin Chishti the celebrated Sufi saint who settled there in the 12th century attracted devotees from all creeds. Near Ajmer is a lake, Pushkar, which has attracted pilgrims from ancient times. So important temple towns were, were Vilas, Vilas Vamin in Madhya Pradesh, then Somnath in Gujarat, Kanchipuram and Madurai in Tamil Nadu and Tirupati in Andhra Pradesh. Then pilgrimage centers also developed into townships, example Vrindavan in Uttar Pradesh and Tiruvannan Malai in Tamil Nadu. So these were the temple towns and the pilgrimage centers. Now network of small towns. From the 8th century onwards, the subcontinent was dotted with several small towns. This probably emerged from large villages. They usually had a mandapika or mandi of later music, later times, to which nearly villagers brought their produce to sale. They also had market streets called hatta, hut of later times, lined with shops. Besides, there were streets for different kinds of artisans such as potters, oil press pressures, sugar makers, toddy makers, smiths, stone machine, mas etc. While town to town, many came from far and near to these towns to buy local articles and sell products of distant places like horses, salt, camphor, saffron, bitter nut and spices like pepper. pepper. Usually a Samantha or in later times a Zamindar built a fortified palace in or near these towns. They lived taxes on traders, artisans and articles of trade and sometimes donated the right to collect these taxes to local temples which had been built by themselves or by rich merchants. These rites were recorded in inscriptions that has been survived to these days. Small towns emerged from large villages. They usually had a mandapika or mandi or later times to which nearly villagers brought their produce to sale. Then different kinds of artisans such as potters, oil brushers, sugar makers, toddy makers, smiths and etc. also lived in this town. Then the zamindar, what they did, they collected taxes from all these traders, artisans and uh, the articles of trade who comes to produce or sell, or sell their uh, products. Then they sometimes and sometimes also these zamindars, what they did, they donated to the uh, local temples out of the taxes they had they used to collect from the uh, different uh, traders and artisans. Then these rites were recorded in inscriptions that have survived to this day. 
Now, taxes on markets. The following is a summary from a 10th century inscription from Rajasthan, which lists the dues that were to be collected by temple authorities. There were taxes in kind of sugar and jaggery, dyes, thread and cotton, on coconuts, salt, areca nuts, butter, sesame oil, on cloth. Besides, there were taxes on traders, on those who sold metal goods, on distillers, on oil, on cattle fodder, and on loads of grain. Some of these taxes were collected in kind, while others were collected in cash. Now, this were the taxes where, where the zamindars used to uh, ask, like the products, these were the products like sugar and jaggery dyes, red, cotton cloth, coconut salt, then nuts, butter, sesame oil. Then sometimes the zamindas or the samanta, they used to collect the taxes in cash or they used to tell them to give their, say, uh, to give their uh, produce, means their products. Now, traders big and small. There were many kinds of traders. This included the Banjaras. The, who are the Banjaras? The Banjaras are the ones who move from one place to another. Several traders, especially horse traders, formed association with headmen who negotiated on their behalf with warriors who brought horses. Then since traders had to pass through many kingdoms and forests, they usually traveled in caravans and formed guilds to protect their interests. There were several such as guilds in South India from the 8th century onwards. The most famous being the Mani, Manigramam and Nanadesi. These guilds trade extensively both within the peninsula and with Southern, Southeast Asia and China. There were also communities like the, Chet, the Chetiyas and the Marwari Oswal, who went on to become the principal trading groups of the country. Gujarati traders, including the communities of Hindu, Baniyas and Muslim Boras, trade extensively with the ports of the Red Sea, Persian Gulf, East Africa, Southeast Asia and China. They sold textiles and spices in these ports and in exchange brought gold and ivory from Africa and spices, tin, China, Chinese blue pottery and silver from Southeast Asia and China. The towns on the west coast were home to Arab Persian, Chinese, Jewish and Syrian Christian traders, Indian sp spices and cloth sold in the Red Sea ports were purchased by Italian traders and eventually reached European markets fetching very high profits. Spices grown in tropical climate, pepper, cinnamon, nutmeg, dried ginger etc. became an important part of European cooking and cotton cloth was very attractive. They eventually drew European traders to India. We will shortly read about how this changed the face of the trading and town. So there were many kinds of traders. They usually traveled in caravans and formed guilds to protect their interest. Then there were also communities like the Chatiyas and the Malwari Oswal. Gujarati traders trade extensively with the ports of the Red Sea, Persian Gulf, East Africa, Southeast Asia and China. The craftsperson then on, uh, of Bidar was very famous. The inlay work in copper and silver came to known as Bidri. Now, crafts in town. The craftsperson of Bidar were so framed for their inlay work in copper and silver that it came to be called Bidri. The Panchalas or Vishwakarma community consisting of goldsmith, bronzemith, blacksmith, mason and carpenters were essential to the buildings of temple. They also played an important role in the constructions of palaces, big buildings, tanks and reservoirs. Similarly, weavers such as the Salier or 
sky colors emerged as prosperous communities making donations to temple. Some aspects of cloth making like cotton cleaning, spinning and dyeing became specialized and independent craft. See figure for a shawl border. How beautifully it is made. Next, in figure 5, a 17th century candle stand brass with black overlay. This is a candle stand of the 17th century. Now, the changing fortunes of towns. Small, some towns like Ahmedabad, which is in Gujarat, went on to becoming more major commercial cities, but others like the Tanjavur shrank in size and importance over the centuries. Murshidabad in West Bengal, on the banks of the Bhagirathi, which rose to, pro to prominence as a center for silk and became the capital of Bengal in 1704, declined in the course of the century as the weavers faced competitions from cheap mill made cloth from England. Now, a closure look, Hampi, Mausali Patnam and Surat, the architectural splendor of Hampi. Hampi is located in the Krishna Tungabhadra Basin, which formed in the nucleus of the Vijayanagara Empire, founded in 1336. The magnificent, the magnificent ruins at Hampi revealed a well-fortified city. No mortar or cementing agent was used in the constructions of these walls and the technique followed was to wedge them together by interlocking. The architecture of Hampi was distinctive. The buildings in the royal complex had splendid arches, domes and pillared halls with niches for holding sculptures. They also had well-planned orchards, orchards and pleasure gardens with sculptural motif motifs such as the lotus and the corbels. In its heyday in the 15th, 16th century, Hampi bustled with commercial and cultural activities. Moors, a name used collectively for Muslim merchants, Chattis, and agents of European traders such as the Portuguese thronged the markets of Hampi. Temples were the hub of cultural activities and Devadasi, temple dances, performed before the deity, royalty and masses in the many pillared halls in the Virupa, Virupaksha, a form of Shiva. Temple, the, Mahanav the Mahanavami festival, known today is Navratri, in the south was most of the more important festivals celebrated at Hampi. Archaeologists have found the Mahanavami platform where the king received guests and accepted tribute from subordinate chiefs. From here, he also watched dance and music performance as well as wrestling bouts. Hampi fell into ruin following the defeat of Vijayanagara in 1565 by the Deccani Sultans, the rulers of Golconda, Vijaypur, Amdanagar, Berar and Bidar. So Hampi was the capital of Vijayanagar, Vijayanagara Empire. The architecture of Hampi was distinctive. It bustled with commercial and cultural activities during the 15th to 16th century. Then Hampi fell into ruin following the defeat of Vijayanagara in 1565 by the Deccani Sultans. Next, a gateway to the west, Surat. Surat in Gujarat was emporium of western Western trade during the Mughal period along with Kambe, present day Kambat, and somewhat later. Ahmedabad Surat was the gateway for trade with West Asia by the Gulf of Ormuz. Surat has also been called the gate to Mecca because many pilgrim ships set sail from here. 
The city was cosmopolitan and people of all castes and creeds lived there. In the 17th century, the Portuguese, Dutch and English had their factories and warehouses at Surat. According to the English chronicle, Oving Jong, who wrote an account of the port in 1689, on average a hundred ships of different countries could be found anchored at the port at any given time. There were also several retail and wholesale shops selling cotton textiles. The textiles of Surat was famous for their gold lace borders, Zari, and had a market in West Asia. African Europe In West Asia, Africa and Europe, the state built numerous rest houses to take care of the needs of people from all over the world who came to the city. There were magnificent buildings and innumerable pleasures park. The Khaitiwar states or Mahajan's money changers had huge banking houses at Surat. It is not worthy that the Surat Hundis. Now what is Hundi? It is a note recording, recording a deposit made by a person. The amount deposit can be claimed in another place by presenting the record of the deposit. Were honored in the fear of, of in the far off markets of Cairo in Egypt, Basra in Iraq, and Antwerp in Belgium. However, Surat began to decline towards the end of the 17th century. This was because of manufactures, the loss of markets and productivity because of the decline of the Mughal Empire, control of the sea routes by the Portuguese, and competitions from Bombay, present-day Mumbai, where the English East India Company shifted its headquarters in 1668. Today, Surat is a bustling commercial center. Now, Emporium. Emporium means a place where goods from diverse production centers are brought and sold. Now, Surat is in Gujarat was a cosmopolitan city. People of all castes and creeds lived here. The textile of Surat were famous for their gold lace borders known as Zari and had a market in West Asia, Africa and Europe. Now Surat began, began to decline towards the end of the 17th century. Now fishing in troubled waters, Masulipatnam. The town of Masulipatnam or Masulipatnam literally fish pot town lay on the delta of the Krishna river. In the 17th century, it was a center of intense activity. Both the Dutch and the English East India companies attempted to control Masulipatnam as it became the most important port on the Andhra coast. The fort at Masulipatnam was built by the Dutch. A poor fisher town. This is a description of Masli Patnam by William Matwood, a factor of the English East India Company in 1620. This is the chief port of Golconda, where the right worshipful East India Company have their agent. It is a small town but populous. Unwelled, ill built, and worse situated. Within all the springs are brackish. It was first a poor fisher town. Afterwards, the convenience of the road, a place where ships can anchor, made it a residence for merchants and so continues since our, since our and the Dutch nation frequented this coast. The Qutub Sahi ruler of Golconda imposed royal monopolies on the sale of textiles, spices and other items to prevent the trade passing completely into the hands of the various East India companies. Fires competitions among various trading groups the Golconda nobles, Persian merchants, Telugu Komati, 
Chetis and European traders made the city populous and prosperous. So these are the people who made who made the city, the fishing city, very populous. As the Mughals began to extend their power to Golconda, Golconda, their representative, the governor Mir Jumla, who was also a merchant, began to play off the Dutch and the English against each other. In 1686-1687, Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb annexed Golconda. This caused the European companies to look for alternatives. It was a part of the new policy of the East India Company that it was not enough if a port had connections with the production centers of the hinterland. The new company trade centers, it was felt, should combine political, administrative and commercial roles. As the company traders moved to Bombay, Kolkata, Calcutta, present-day Kolkata, and Madras, present-day Chennai, Masulipatnam lost both its merchants and prosperity and declined in the course of the 18th century. Begin today nothing more than a dilapidated little town. The new towns and traders. We saw that the, in the previous topic that fishing in troubled waters, that is in Masulipatnam. The town of Masulipatnam was a center of intense activity in the 17th century. Then the Qutub Shahi ruler of Golconda decided to prevent the attempts of the various East India companies. As a result, various competitions among various trading groups made by the city populous and prosperous. However, Golconda was annexed by Aurangzeb in 1686-1687. Then the English emerged as the most successful commercial and political power in the subcontinent. Indian textiles were in great demand in Europe and West Asia. New Towns and Traders in the 16th and 17th century, European countries were searching for spices and textile which had become popular both in Europe and West Asia. The English, Dutch and French formed East India companies in order to expand their commercial activities in the East. Initially, great Indian traders like Mullah Abdul Ghafur and Virji Vora, who owned a large number of ships competed with them. However, the European companies used their naval power to gain control of the sea trade and forced Indian traders to work as their agents. Ultimately, the English emerged as the most successful commercial and political power in the subcontinent. The spread in demand for goods like textile led to a great expansion of the crafts of spinning weaving, bleaching, dyeing, etc. with more and more people taking them up. Indian textile designs became increasingly refined. However, this period also saw the decline of the independence of craftsperson. They now began to work on a system of advances which meant that they had to weave cloth which was already promised to European agents. Weavers no longer had the liberty of selling their own cloth or weaving their own patterns. They had to repro reproduce the design supplied to them by the company agents. The 18th century saw the rise of Bombay, Calcutta and Madras, which are nodal cities today. Crafts and commerce underwent major changes as marches and artisans were moved into the black towns established by the European companies within these new cities. The blacks or native traders and craftspersons were confined here while the white rulers occupied the superior residence of Fort St. George in Madras or Fort St. William in Calcutta. The story of the crafts and commerce in the 18th century will be taken up next year.
So in new towns and traders, Bombay, Calcutta and Madras became important cities in the 18th century. But the European established black towns in these cities and the merchants and the artisans were made to move there. While the white rulers occupied the superior residence of Fort St. George in Madras or Fort St. William in Calcutta. So the Britishers, the East India Company, what they did, they divided into black and white. All the black, that is the Indians, were sent to the new cities and, um, and the white that is the Britishers, they started ruling and occupied almost all the parts of the cities. Vasco de Gama and Christopher Columbus In the 15th century, European sailors undertook unprecedented explorations of sea routes. They were driven by the desire to find ways of reaching the Indian subcontinent and obtaining spices. Vasco de Gama, a Portuguese sailor, sailed down the African coast, went round the Cape of Good Hope and crossed over to the Indian Ocean. His first journey took more than a year. He reached Calicut in 1498 and returned to Lisbon, the capital of Portugal. The following year, he lost two of his four ships and the 170 men at the start of the journey. Only 54 survived. In spite of the obvious hazards, the routes that were opened up proved to be extremely profitable. And he was followed by English, Dutch and French sailors. The search for sea routes to India had another unexpected fallout. On the assumptions that the earth was round, Christopher Columbus, an Italian, decided to sail westwards across the Atlantic Ocean to find a route to India. He landed in the West Indies, which got their name because of his confusion in 1492. He was followed by sailors and conquerors from Spain and Portugal who occupied large part of Central and South America, often destroying earlier settlements in the area. So this is a picture of Vasco de Gama. Now this is the end of the chapter. Next time I will meet you with a new topic. Till then students take care of yourself and thank you so much.